Life in the United States has long been one of the many challenges for minorities. Taking into account the early advantages that were not given to African Americans specifically can help one to understand why financially, most of us aren't nearly as wealthy as our white counterparts. While more modern times have created more opportunities to become extremely wealthy, this task was much harder to complete back in the early 1900s. Rebuilding was that much more difficult considering that so many black people were still feeling the effects from coming out of the life of slavery. Nevertheless, there were were a handful of black people that were able to complete this feat, with perhaps none more infamous than 11-year-old Sarah Rector. Her riches would come after a shock of the quality of land that she received through legislation that was actually aimed at keeping many black people disenfranchised. As a young girl from the South, Sarah would go on to becoming the first black child millionaire. Her wealth caused dismay among many whites, which is why the government wanted to legally declare Sarah Rector a white woman, making sure her fortune would be claimed by whites instead of blacks. While Sarah would go on to live a relatively short life dying at the age of 64, when taking into account the groundbreaking history of becoming wealthy, Sarah Rector's role to being a millionaire is a story you should know. Born on March 3rd, 1902 to Joseph and Rose Rector outside of Twine, Oklahoma, nearby Taft, Oklahoma, Sarah was raised in a small cabin that was actually part of the Muskegee Creek Indian land allotment. Due to Sarah's grandparents being enslaved Creek tribe members, the Dawes Allotment Act ended up granting land to both the parents and all their children, which included Sarah, her brother Joe Jr., and sister Rebecca. At the time, Sarah's portion of the land was valued at a little over $550. Now, this land that was given was one of the poorest quality, leaving little room for agricultural growth and the subsequent finances to be gained due to the more rough and rocky terrain that accompanied these portions of land. Black Pass website includes an article speaking to the plan that eventually led to the accidental discovery of a drilling site on Sarah's property that would be the pathway to her riches. Primarily to generate enough revenue to pay the $30 annual tax bill, in February 1911, Rector's father leased her allotment to the Devonian Oil Company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 1913, however, her fortunes changed when Wildcat oil driller B.B. Jones produced a gusher that brought in 2,500 barrels a day. This now changed Rector's income to $300 per day. Once this wealth was made known, Rector's guardianship was switched from her parents to a white man named T.J. Porter, an individual personally known by the Rectors. An article published by the American Historical Association helps to shed some light onto how people of the time felt about guardianship and the law that allowed for whites to take over the managing of finances for a young black person of wealth like Sarah. According to the Kansas City Public Library archives, white papers claimed Judge Leia was tough on guardians who held discrepancies in their accounting. According to the judge, Sarah's parents had selected Porter for guardian and Porter received 2% of Sarah's income a relatively low figure. Now, while this piece shows that Sarah may not have had a horrible deal, considering the family was saved from poverty through this deal and paying less than others, the eventual creation of Children's Division through the NAACP show that black people were simply furious with the process and believed it should be legal for courts to assign these guardians. As time went on, there were more wells in the area discovered that produced a lot of oil. This all accumulated with Sarah's land being part of the Cushing Drum right field that saw her earn over $11,000 in one one month by the end of 1913. Taking inflation to consideration, the earnings of Sarah would be equivalent to about $7,500 per day. Rumors began to circulate early on as the wealth came in as articles notable from the Kansas City Star and the Chicago Defender painted the girl as living in unsanitary conditions with people that were mismanaging her money and providing her with low quality clothing. Around the same time, many more newspapers would begin to write more about Rector, even mentioning her capturing the attention of grown men. According to an article from Black Enterprise, in January 1914, the newspaper wrote, Oil made Piccaninny rich. Oklahoma girl with $50,000 a month gets many proposals. Four white men in Germany want to marry the Negro child that they might share her fortune. Meanwhile, the Savannah Tribune wrote, Oil well produces neat income. Negro girls $112,000 a year. These newspapers would post information that simply was not true. And during these times, no one griped at the fact that grown German men had actually sent marriage proposals to a 12 year old girl. Ironically, the land that Sarah possessed that would make her a millionaire was almost sold prior to the discovery of the barrels of oil that would be 
drilled just a few years later. In 1910, as Sarah's family struggled to pay the taxes on the land, the father petitioned to the tribe to be able to sell the land as he wished, to fall no further behind on his payments. Due to the land being granted to the family via treaty as payment for the enslavement of their ancestors, the government declared that the land could not be sold and demanded that the taxes for the year 1910 would still be paid off in accordance with previously scheduled payments. During the rise of Sarah becoming wealthy, the addition of a white guardian along with simple mismanagement became a running story that would gain nationwide attention. According to Ranker, the NAACP stepped in to work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the United States Children's Bureau to correct this mismanagement of Sarah's estate. As James C. Waters Jr., an agent for the NAACP wrote, is it not possible to have her cared for in a decent manner and by people of her own race instead of by a member of a race which deny her and her kind the treatment accorded a good yard dog? This protection by prominent black people of the day was crucial as it led to Rector being able to keep a substantial enough portion of her wealth to remain rich when she died. Another great effort that came for Sarah's situation was the creation of the Children's Department of the NAACP, which was designed to investigate mistreatment of black children, specifically that were being overseen by a white guardian due to them having a certain amount of wealth. Rector was well-educated, having attended school with the help of Booker T. Washington. Relocating to Alabama, Sarah would attend the Tuskegee Boarding School and Institute, later changed to Tuskegee University, as he was always looking to uplift others and helping Sarah created a great opportunity to do so. Attendance at these schools and the information Rector gained from the Center of Knowledge is what helped the later relocation to a larger city of Kansas City, Missouri, and maintaining the wealth from there and beyond. According to the information gained from the Black Past article, when Rector turned 18 on March 3rd, 1920, she left Tuskegee and her entire family moved with her to Kansas City, Missouri. By this point, Rector, who now owns stocks and bonds, a boarding house and bakery, the Busy Bee Cafe in Oklahoma, as well as 2,000 acres of Prime River bottomland, was a millionaire. This status as a millionaire was unprecedented for the time as Rector was again a black woman living in the South. The idea that she had accumulated so much money as a person of color was so unbelievable that she was not even able to continue to be declared as an African-American girl. One perk of this was that using railroad cars became something Rector was now qualified to do being that she was legally deemed a white girl. Information gathered in an article from the Ranker revealed that the Oklahoma legislator went so far to declare Sarah Rector a white person. As reported in the Chicago Defender, the white people have become so alarmed at this enormous wealth of this young girl that they do not like such wealth belonging to a girl of Afro-American blood. Upon giving Sarah this designation as a white girl, she would be forced into having a white guardian who would oversee her assets. At the time, the government was not happy about the fact that Sarah, luckily as a descendant of slaves, was able to be earning so much money at such a young age. Over the years, the guardians would change and there would be inevitably more money stolen via corrupt practices and plain theft. However, with an overall support family behind her, Sarah was able to retain a large portion of the wealth still in order to live a life that was far cry from the one lived as a poor slave like that of her parents. In 1920, Sarah would marry and throughout the years would go on to have three sons of her own with Kenneth Campbell. It's worth noting that this only came after the mismanagement of money and other issues for Rector essentially ended giving way to her living her life more freely as an adult. When Rector moved to Kansas City, she would go on to purchase her infamous Rector mansion and it was noted that she was not shy about spending her money. Some would even describe the lifestyle lived by Rector as extravagant. More information from the Rector article reveals that Sarah Rector used her money to live a luxurious life. She bought a limousine, hired a chauffeur to drive neighborhood children to their elementary school, in addition to her purchase of the Rector mansion. Sarah's husband opened the second black owned auto dealership in the country and she bought expensive clothes and diamonds because she refused to hide her wealth. In fact, she used her money to help others. This period of time marks somewhat of a peak for Rector as she would go on to lose a decent portion of her wealth during the Great Depression. Much of the elaborate spending came as Rector and her first husband Kenneth Campbell would frequently host guests such as Duke Ellington and Count Bassey at their home, being recognized by many in the general public as royalty. 
Sarah Rector had become the first African American to own an automobile dealership with her husband becoming the second. More wealth came from the business model to predominantly sell luxury vehicles, being that they had the clientele. Historians believe the loss of so much money during the depression may have led to the divorce of Rector and Campbell in 1930. Sadly, at the age of 65, Sarah Rector passed away on July 2nd, 1967. By this time, much of her wealth had diminished as her lavish spending continued as she aged. Nevertheless, Rector set herself up wisely, still having oil wells that were operable in real estate throughout the country that would allow for her children to have something to gain money from. The legacy of such a young girl with humble beginnings, becoming the richest Negro in the country, should never be forgotten. Sarah Rector is a legend in both the African American community and American history due to what she was able to accomplish. Regardless of how the land was given to her, to capitalize on the opportunities showed her perseverance and ability to succeed in the face of adversity. Stay up to date with the latest news in comedy, music, and sports by subscribing here to our YouTube channel. Follow the comedy hype across all social media and look out for new original content on our new streaming service. For Hype Plus News, I'm Symphony Thompson.